Okay, let's start it. Welcome all NYU students and students around the world. My name is Eduard Zvalovsky, Deputy Opinion Editor at Washington Square News. On behalf of WSN, thank you, Professor Chomsky, for doing this interview. I also want to extend a special thanks to the Liberal Studies Program for their support and to my fellow student, Alice Sholto Douglas, for her collaboration in the project and technical assistance today. Despite the impending blizzard and a cold, mm -hmm. Professor Chomsky has generously obliged to readjust his schedule for this interview, for which we are incredibly, indescribably grateful. Um, before I begin with the questions, I just want to note for the viewers that Professor Chomsky is the eighth most cited scholar of all time, joining the ranks of Plato, Aristotle, Shakespeare, and Freud. Uh, so on to my first question, and uh, this is a topic that specifically concerns me as a student. Since the start of the Occupy movement, many protesters have put matters concerning rising tuition costs and student loans among the top of their demands. During her campaign, Jill Stein provocatively compared student debt to a modern form of indenture. And you have expressed a similar view, arguing that student indebtedness is a technique of indoctrination and control. Could you please elaborate on that? Well, the first question that <clears throat> arises is whether there's uh, an economic necessity for student debt. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have to tell students what the numbers are. Right. It's over a trillion dollars. It's beyond credit card debt. So is, it, is there an economic justification? Well, there are a number of ways of testing that. So, for example, we happen to be right next door to a poor country, Mexico. Uh, quite a good university system. Mm -hmm. It's not doesn't have all the things we have. It's a poor country, but very high quality, high, high level of instruction. So I've taught there, been there. Mm -hmm. It's free. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, there was an attempt by the government some years ago, 10, 15 years ago, to uh, raise costs slightly. It led to a national student strike. Uh, the country was practically closed down and they backed off. In fact, uh, last time I was there, about two years ago, there was an administration building that was still occupied by students mm -hmm. from the student strike uh, long before it had been turned into a community center. Uh, that's Mexico, a poor country. Uh, just in the last, in our northern border, in Quebec, where tuition is higher than Mexico, you know, there is tuition, but it's not at our level. Uh, there was an attempt by the government a couple of months ago to raise the tuition. There was a student strike in Quebec, uh, joined by much of the population. Uh, it led not only to backing off on that proposal, but actually to a change in the government. Uh, a lot of changes, the protests against neoliberal policies and much more. Uh, uh, there are rich countries that have a very high level uh, uh, educational systems. Among the highest are uh, Finland and uh, Germany, They're both free. Uh, if you go back in American history, you go back to the 1950s, that's a much poorer country than, than it is now. Uh, but uh, tuition wasn't exactly free, but it was pretty close to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and under the GI Bill, a huge number of people went to school at government expense, uh, meaning no tuition, essentially very low fees. I mean, I was a student back in the okay. 40s at an Ivy League college, and uh, tuition was about $100, maybe equivalent of 800 mm -hmm. today or something. Uh, uh, these comparisons suggest very strongly that there's no real economic reason for uh, a high student debt. So we have to then ask what it's doing. Well, it, it is part of a much more general process. Uh, over the past generation, essentially 30 odd years, uh, there's been a major assault on the population. Mm -hmm. Basically, the neoliberal era 
That's one of the reasons why there's now a slogan, the 1%, 99%. Right. We're back to levels of inequality that uh, uh, among the highest in history before the first of prison, the Great Depression. Uh, there's been economic growth during these years, but it's overwhelmingly gone into very few pockets. Mm -hmm. Since by now, <coughs> latest figures I saw, there are 400 people in the United States mm -hmm. who have as much wealth, more wealth in fact, than the lowest uh, 180 million uh, uh, wages and, uh, and have pretty much have grown very slowly, more or less stagnated for most of the population, mm -hmm. sometimes declined. Well, meanwhile, there's been enormous wealth going to a tiny percentage of the population. I mean, the 1%, 99% imagery isn't really right. It's more like one-tenth of 1% <laughs> if you look at the way the graphs actually work. And uh, that's led to lots of cons. It's, it's not an economic necessity, like it's not happening in comparable countries. And it's having, uh, there are a lot of other effects. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the uh, OECD, the organization of uh, the affluent countries, the dev so-called developed countries, mm -hmm. and they just did a study of uh, social justice in 31 OECD countries. The U.S. was 27th, uh, right above Mexico. <laughs> you have to remember, this is okay. the richest country in the world with enormous advantages that no one else has. Uh, there are other studies of uh, uh, the infant mortality, uh, the maternal health, uh, uh, lots of uh, measures. And the United States is way down at the bottom of the rich countries, mm -hmm. around 20th, 21st, of them, which is just totally scandalous. In fact, the health care is a, a remarkable case. We have about twice the per capita costs of other uh, rich countries and uh, relatively poor outcomes in addition to uh, tens of millions of people dying every year because they don't have insurance. Uh, the new program will dig into that a little, but nowhere near where it should. Uh, for people who are worried about the deficit, which they shouldn't be, it's declining, it's not that serious. Uh, the deficit would be erased if we had a health care system like comparable countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, and, and the reasons are not terribly obscure. It's, it's the only uh, pri virtually privatized, uh, lightly regulated system in the world. So it's highly inefficient with uh, huge administrative costs, uh, uh, advertising, uh, profit for uh, the private companies, huge salaries, uh, a lot of waste, uh, mm -hmm. cherry picking, all kinds of things. Uh, the, uh, which, in fact, uh, could there are a couple of parts of the U.S. system which are government-run. One is the VA system, Veterans Administration. So that's kind of like European countries, about the same level mm -hmm. of costs and efficiency. Uh, Medicare, which is government-run, is much more efficient than the privatized system. The costs are going up, and there's a lot of talk about the burden of Medicare. But that's because it has to work through the privatized insurance system. Mm -hmm. if its own administrative costs and others are quite low in comparison. And it's kind of interesting to look at the proposals that are now being discussed. So one of the proposals for dealing with the, the deficit problem, which again is not a major problem. The banks care about it, the population doesn't, and they're right. Uh, but if you um, one of the proposals that's being rooted around is that uh, the age for Medicare eligibility should be increased. <laughs> uh, that's quite an interesting proposal. Uh, for one thing, it's got a class basis. Uh, professionals, uh, white collar workers and so on, tend to live longer than truck drivers and construction workers and people doing hard manual labor. So as you move up uh, the the level in which Medicare eligibility comes, you're essentially arming uh, the, the poorer working people, mm -hmm. benefiting the more wealthy, uh, educated sector. But even more interesting than that is the fact that raising the uh, age 
is a move from a more efficient system to a less efficient system. So it's actually more costly. But the way cost is measured, and that's just ideological, it's not an economic necessity. If costs are transferred to individuals, they're not considered costs. It's only if, uh, it's, uh, if it's the, a business, then it's a cost. If it's the government, it's a cost, because the rich don't like to pay taxes, and uh, the business, uh, of course, wants to have profit. So if you can find a way to transfer costs to individuals, that's called savings. Uh, like uh, you, you came up here today on the train, uh, the train from New York to Boston uh, takes about the same amount of time as when my wife and I took it 60 years ago. Uh, if you were in any European country or almost any country, it would have taken a, a third the time probably. And that's a cost, but it's a cost to you, uh, not a cost to, uh, to Amtrak or to the, you know, to the government. And it's the same if, uh, you know, I, I, I had to fly yesterday for some talks. If you fly on an airplane, in order to save money for the private carriers, uh, they don't circulate air. Well, there's a cost of that too, like what you're hearing, you know. <laughs> and one of the costs of not circulating air is it circulates diseases. So if somebody on the plane has a cold, you know, everybody ends up with a cold or the flu or something. But that's a cost that's transferred to individuals, and therefore it doesn't count. You don't count it in when you measure efficiency. Incidentally, this is happening at the universities too. Mm -hmm. As the universities get more corporatized, uh, there's been a, during this period of sharp rise in tuition, uh, not for economic reasons, I think, uh, there's also been an enormous increase in uh, ratio of administrators to faculty. There's a couple of studies that just Benjamin Ginsburg, a well-known sociologist, has a book on it called The Fall of the Faculty. It discusses the sharp rise in number of administrators and the tendency to have professional administrators. It, the universities used to have uh, administrators from the faculty that took off for a couple of years and went back. But a lot of the administrators are now are professionals. They're people who come from business schools. You know, they have a business school mentality, and you have to keep the, uh, you have to look at the bottom line. Well, you have to save money, you have to get what's called efficiency. And they use the uh, corporate economic model of efficiency. So if the costs are less for the institution, it's more efficient. For example, if you can reduce the uh, proportion of faculty to teaching by getting temps, you know, low-paid teachers, like say graduate students, mm -hmm. who have low salary, who will have low salaries, no benefits. Uh, uh, if they can take over the work of highly paid fa faculty, that's efficient. It's not efficient for the students. They're not getting the same level of uh, uh, education, surely. And it's not good for the graduate students either. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but that's called efficiency. Well, all of these things, there's a lot more like this. Uh, all of this is going on in parallel as part of uh, the whole neoliberal onslaught, uh, which is it's very harmful to the population, very beneficial to the to the masters, the super rich, they're doing fine. Like uh, uh, after they caused the latest financial crisis, uh, the big banks, the perpetrators are richer than ever, bigger than ever, the corporate profits are uh, reaching records, the bonuses are huge and so on. Uh, the population suffers, but not them. Uh, uh, this relates, incidentally, to some things that Occupy is doing. Mm -hmm. So among the, uh, I don't want to go on too long, shall we continue? Well, among the Occupy concerns are things like uh, uh, going, uh, in fact, one of the projects that's coming up is called Occupy the Economy, right. uh, deal with the tremendous concentration of wealth, which carries along with it the concentration of political power that's almost reflexive. Uh, cost of election skyrockets if to depend on rich donors, corporate donors, and ends up kind of controlling the political system, which is shredding. You know, you can see it very clearly. To go through some of the details, and uh, going after that is a critical point. Yes. Um, 
So what kind of actions should we students, for example, at NYU, pursue? Obviously, we need to organize and create student groups addressing these issues that you have outlined. But what other more specific tactics would you suggest so that we can go beyond merely communicating this message about debt as a form of entrapment and indoctrination and move to demanding substantive change of some sort? You could look at the model of other countries. Mm -hmm. For example, the ones on our borders, uh, Mexico and Quebec. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the protests in Mexico, remember, was a protest against a small increase in essentially free education. Mm -hmm. But it uh, swept a large part of the country. Mm -hmm. In Quebec, it uh, drew in a large part of the population. It was tied to concerns of many other people. It's not just the students who are suffering from this. This attack on the population is much broader. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why you have a situation in which, like what I described, what you all know, the, the, the kind of stagnation or something like it for a large part, even the majority of the population, while there is growth, uh, especially for the poorer people, it's much worse. Mm -hmm. uh, for the black population, uh, the wealth was almost wiped out by the last recession. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the, uh, if the student movement, can, in, in many places, in the United States too, uh, historically the student movements have been kind of in the forefront of large-scale social change. Uh, so for example, the, the changes in this country, there's mm -hmm. been a lot of progress in the country in the last 40 years or so. A lot of it came from student initiative. I take the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been a civil rights movement in efforts for a long time. But one major spur to it was <coughs> around 1960 when a small group of black students sat in a lunch counter, uh, kicked out, arrested, brutalized, and others came. Pretty soon you had the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee mm -hmm. get free of buses. Uh, students from the North coming down. Uh, it wasn't all story, but it was the cutting edge of what became a mass movement that achieved some goals, not all, but some goals. Uh, mm. the, uh, uh, the women's movement, a lot of it came from young women organizing consciousness raising groups, uh, pressing demands, finally it spread. Uh, the environmental movement has, a lot of it has come from student activism, not 100%. But the anti-war movement, it was very clear, it was mostly students. And this is true of many other cases in this country and elsewhere. So the students can become kind of a galvanizing force, mm -hmm. not just for their own personal concerns of, you know, I don't want to be in debt for the rest of my right. life, but because it's part of a general social problem. It's part of a general attack, really, is an attack on the population. And it should be possible to link up with other sectors that are suffering under the same attack uh, in different ways. Like, say, people working for the minimum wage. Uh, the minimum, uh, there was a time during the period of growth, significant growth in the country, the 50s and 60s, when the minimum wage pretty much tracked productivity. That started to separate about you know 30 plus years ago, uh, if the minimum wage had kept up with productivity, it would probably two or three times as high as it is now. Well, th that means people working at the minimum wage are paying the costs of the wealth of the one tenth of one percent. And when you pull down the minimum wage, you pull down all wages. Mm -hmm. uh, th these are all broad issues that uh, the student movement can to help uh, uh, galvanize, move forward mm -hmm. with. Uh, what do you make of the increased professionalization and specialization among undergraduate departments in universities? By professionalization, 
I mean that the curriculums are under more and more pressure to respond to the demands of the market, such as getting a job, etc. In addition, and in, in tandem with this in some respects, uh, it seems that there is a great push to make some fields seem as much as exact sciences, uh, sciences as possible. For instance, the humanities seem to be under great attack because they do not produce tangible outcomes and assessments that can be fit onto a balance sheet determined by market logic. What should happen to traditional humanities disciplines from your perspective given these pressures? Depends whether we want to live in a civilized world or not. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, the wealth and richness of life uh, doesn't come from having more uh, gadgets in your hands. Mm -hmm. It comes from uh, literature, arts, uh, uh, decent society, uh, decent human relations, uh, uh, many other things that don't have, that you can't put a number on. Uh, marketization of life is another form of destroying it. I mean, this was well understood by the working classes in the early ages of the Industrial Revolution, in fact, all through their modern history. You go back to the 19th century, uh, uh, there's quite good scholarly studies of it. The, the British working classes, you know, in Dickensian England wasn't very pretty, uh, had a very high level of culture. Uh, they were uh, reading uh, contemporary literature, what we call classics now, and uh, the studies compare the uh, 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 proletarian culture uh, with the uh, philistinism of the aristocratic culture. The same in the United States. You go back to the early industrial towns right around here, in fact, eastern Massachusetts. Uh, the, uh, uh, the young women from the farms who were coming into the mills were uh, bitterly condemned the fact that their culture was being destroyed. They were being turned into tools of production instead of independent women. Uh, an Irish artisan, in, of, say a blacksmith in Boston, if he could get a little money, would hire a young boy to read to him while he's working. Uh, I, mean, I can remember it. It went on into the 1930s. Mm -hmm. My, you know, as a kid, my family were mostly unemployed working class, mostly in New York. Uh, some, a lot of them had never really had much formal schooling, a couple of years maybe. Uh, but they were uh, going to Shakespeare plays in the they were um, talking about the Budapest String Quartet, uh, discussing the latest uh, uh, debates in psychoanalysis between <laughs> Freud and Speckle and every possible right. political movement. It's, uh, and there was working class education, in which incidentally a lot of quite good scientists and mathematicians participated. Mm -hmm. There was work written for workers' education. There were workers' education programs, a lot of it run by the unions and so on. A lot of that's been beaten out of people's heads, mm -hmm. but it could be restored. Now, and that's a decent society. Uh, if you go back to the 19th century labor press, which is very interesting, it, it bitterly condemned industrial society mm -hmm. as turning people into taking away their freedom, their independence, their integrity as human beings. Uh, in fact, uh, wage labor in the mid 19th century was considered basically the same as slavery. Hmm. Uh, the only difference was it was temporary. In fact, that was such a popular position that it was a program of the Republican Party hmm. in the mid-19th century. It was a program of the Knights of Labor, the huge uh, labor movement that was formed. And in fact, there was an interesting slogan that was emphasized by a lot of working people. The slogan, they described what they called the new spirit of the age that they're trying to ram down our throats. The new spirit of the age is uh, gain wealth, forgetting all but self. <laughs> That's been 150 years of massive efforts to try to indoctrinate people into that belief, but it's so inhuman and savage that it just doesn't work, except mm -hmm. at the periphery. But that's uh, the marketization of every aspect of life is part of this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's. Uh, if you go back to 
it's, 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 if you look at the colleges, uh, the state colleges in the country, a lot of them, are actually reducing uh, in order to preserve the profit, profitability, you know, look at the bottom line, are actually reducing expensive programs where there are jobs. Mm -hmm. Like they're reducing engineering, computer science, and nursing because they're expensive, but they happen to be the programs with jobs. Mm -hmm and uh, turning to cheaper programs, and as you say, the humanities are the kind of marginalized. You can't put a number on uh, developing uh, creative writers or uh, individuals who can enjoy, uh, who can appreciate and contribute to the arts and general culture. And that, that's a very harmful effect on the society altogether. Mm -hmm. So you have to decide what kind of society do you want to live in. Mm -hmm. I think these are among the reasons why the U.S. ranks so low in, say, general social justice. Depends what values you have. Mm -hmm. um, and in a recent public forum with Angela Davis, uh, a veteran activist uh, as well, <laughs> uh, you reiterated one of Martin Luther King Jr.'s most famous statements, that the arc of history is long but it bends towards justice. And of course, it takes a lot of people to bend that arc down as well. Uh, but my question is, what role do universities serve in a just or democratic society? Well, universities ought to be the place where uh, as many people as possible, like say the GI Bill, mm -hmm. have the opportunity to develop their creative capacities, their independence, their joy of discovery, their uh, ability to work with each other to achieve uh, um, social end, desirable social ends that they can figure out. Mm -hmm. uh, students are at university, they're really at the freest time of their lives. They're out of parental control. Uh, <laughs> they don't yet have to devote themselves uh, to putting bread on the table, a lot of freedom and opportunity, and that's the point of a university. Mm -hmm. Actually, going back to Mexico, a poor country, um, the, the, a couple of years ago, the, there was a leftist mayor in Mexico City. He actually opened the university in Mexico City, which is not only free, but has open admissions with uh, support for students who aren't quite up to the academic standards. And it's pretty impressive. I was there, visited, and mm. talked to students, talked to faculty. That's just what a university ought to be. Used to be, it ought to be open to, actually, it ought to be open to the community mm -hmm. and draw people in, just like workers' education programs did. But these opportunities ought to be available to everyone. Uh, the, but they, they are at the forefront of uh, uh, creating the opportunities for a decent uh, society in which, uh, you know, uh, same person would want to live. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to shift to a different topic. Um, in, the, in light of Barack Obama's second inauguration, what is your opinion about the role of the left in the United States? It seems to me that there is an effort among the Democrats specifically um, to depict the president as a victim of capitalist machinations. Um, is this effort a mistake? Should the left in the United States hold Barack Obama more accountable? Accountable to what? Hmm. There's no indication that he has uh, any intention or ever had any intention hmm. or interest in uh, bringing about progressive changes. Hmm. Uh, he's basically a moderate Republican. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, you know, it's, it's commonly said now that the moderate Republicans have disappeared. <laughs> the Republican Party is a party of, in fact, it's what the governor, Bobby Jindal, called them a couple of weeks ago. He said, we're becoming the stupid party. <laughs> uh, it's right. so off the spectrum. But, but what happened to the moderate Republicans? They're now mainstream Democrats, mm. uh, new Democrats. And Obama fits pretty well within that spectrum. I mean, he came into office in 2008. Mm -hmm. with a huge uh, popular support. And the country was going into an economic tailspin at mm -hmm. the time. 
Uh, so the first thing he had to do, of course, was pick an economic team to deal with the problems. Well, take a look at who he picked. Uh, he picked people who had created the problems, mm -hmm. uh, what are called the Rubin boys, you know, <laughs> the ones who were at the forefront of deregulation, of, uh, you know, building the big banks, of uh, 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 providing the government insurance policy which encourages risk, mm -hmm. uh, too big to fail policy, and so on. These are the people who were picked. Mm -hmm. now, there are other highly competent mm -hmm. economists, including uh, Nobel laureates, the people like, say, um, Stiglitz or Krugman and many others, they weren't, they were never invited. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, uh, the, the business press, uh, Bloomberg News mm -hmm. Business Journal, actually reviewed the appointments when they were made and had an interesting article about them, went through each person who was appointed and ended up concluding that uh, half of these people shouldn't be on an economic team, they should be getting subpoenas. Mm -hmm. you know, they're the ones who are the perpetrators of the crisis that we're now in. That gave it away pretty quickly. I mean, he came in, Obama, with huge labor support. And the labor movement had a few uh, serious requests, good right ones. One of them was uh, EFCA, you know, card check, the ability to form. There's been a big, a huge attack on unions, and they wanted to go back to mm -hmm. a rational way of um, organizing, which most workers want, incidentally. Mm -hmm. Obama promised it, but forgot about it right away. Mm -hmm. uh, same on health care. Uh, a, a majority of the population uh, favored a, some kind of rational national health care system. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one residue of that left in Obama's program, public option. Mm -hmm which he gave away uh, with about two-thirds of the population supporting it. Uh, the United States is, I guess, the only country where there's legislation that bans the government from negotiating drug prices. So drug prices are way higher than elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I found only one poll on that, which uh, found that about 85% of the population was opposed. Mm -hmm. It made no effort to deal with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, you know, the claim was, well, I can't get it through Congress mm -hmm. and so on, but uh, you know, the president has a lot of power. Mm -hmm. uh, can appeal to the population, be a leader. Mm -hmm. There have been presidents who did do that, but you have to want to do it, mm -hmm. or be pressured to do it by large-scale popular movements. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you often associate uh, justice with democracy or democracy with justice, working in conjunction together. However, some may argue that the concept of justice and the concept of democracy are the antitheses of each other. In other words, the protections of personal liberties and majority rule are not compatible. NYU professor of politics, Pascale Paschino, argues that by using the word democracy, to encompass a broad range of things, the word loses any real value. And this can have a detrimental effect when we want to make substantive change happen. How do we resolve this paradox? I think we resolve it the way Aristotle did. <laughs> uh, if you go back to the first major book on political theory, Aristotle's Politics, uh, he dealt with, he was of course dealing with Athens, mm -hmm. he state. And uh, uh, he was talking about free men, you know, mm -hmm. not people, so not slaves, not women. But uh, uh, he discussed various kinds of political systems, decided that democracy was maybe the least bad, mm -hmm. so that's what we should prefer. Uh, but he pointed out there's a real problem with democracy. Mm -hmm. The problem is that uh, if uh, the, the voters, if, all, if everyone's free to vote, the ones who are enfranchised, that the poor will use their voting power to redistribute the property of the rich. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, to achieve justice. And of course, we don't want that. Uh, uh, he had a solution. But first, uh, I should notice that Madison raised the same mm -hmm. problem in the Constitutional Convention. Uh, he was talking about England, the model they're thinking of. And in the Constitutional Convention, he discussed the fact that in England, if uh, everyone had the vote, again, you know, excluding the people who are not allowed to vote, like women, mm -hmm. 
But if everyone had the vote, they would, the poor would use their voting power to, uh, to carry out what we'd call land reform. Mm -hmm. These are mostly agricultural societies, and that's unjust. Mm -hmm. So Aristotle and Madison faced the same problem as the professor you're mentioning, the <laughs> conflict between right. democracy and justice, and had opposite solutions. Mm -hmm. Uh, Aristotle's solution was to reduce inequality, mm -hmm. and he proposed what amount to welfare state measures, you know, on a city scale, not our scale, uh, communal meals, you know, things like that, that would reduce the level of inequality, and then you wouldn't have the poor, the mass of the poor, and taking away the property of the rich. Uh, Madison's solution was the opposite. We should reduce democracy, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the way our system is constructed. You look back at the Madisonian system, the constitutional system, uh, power was to be in, in, the, in the Senate. The Senate, of course, was not elected, remember. Mm -hmm. Powers in the Senate, which as Madison explained, constitutes the wealth of the nation, uh, the more responsible set of men, those who uh, sympathize with property owners and their rights. Uh, the executive was mostly an executive at the time. So powers in the hands of the wealthy. There is a House of Representatives, of, and that's more democratic you know, than it was then, isn't now, but uh, for all sorts of reasons. But uh, and that had much less authority and power because it was too democratic. Uh, so we, and then there were other devices to factionalize the population and so on. Now the population didn't really accept that. It was a radical population at the time, and this long struggles through American history to try to uh, achieve uh, the justice uh, within a democratic system. Mm -hmm. And it's a bitter class war that goes on all the time. We're now in a period, last roughly generation, where the class wars turned sharply in favor of extreme wealth. Uh, so we not only have the distribution of wealth that I described, but it also has immediate consequences for uh, for democracy, and they're known. Um, it's good work in the political science, the professional political science, studying uh, attitudes and policy and the correlation between them. We have a lot of information about public opinion, mm -hmm. extensive polling, you know, quite good polls, and the basic result that comes out of the kind of gold standard work. Uh, Martin Gillens, uh, Larry Bartels, and others, is that about 70% of the population is essentially disenfranchised, the lower 70% in wealth and income. But their attitudes have no influence on policy. Mm -hmm. And as you go up the income level, you get slowly more influence. When you get to the very top, essentially get what they want. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a kind of democracy, you know. Uh, everyone's allowed to push a button or something, but uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's nothing like a functional democracy. Mm -hmm. And that's probably one of the main reasons why uh, a lot of the population just doesn't bother voting. Mm -hmm. And it tends to be the poorer part. Nobody's really investigated it, but probably it's just an intuitive understanding. It doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. Why should I bother? And when you get to the House of Representatives, it's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. but that began in the constitutional system as a more democratic part of the government. Now it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. So in the last election, 2012, uh, the Democrats got a considerable majority, but a small, a small minority of the seats uh, for all kinds of reasons, including legislative gerrymandering, uh, mm -hmm. the role of money in politics. This very good study by Thomas Ferguson, the main political scientist who studied uh, the role of money in elections. And he's found that in the last uh, congressional elections, uh, there's almost a perfect correlation between the percentage of the funding that a candidate receives and the probability of the candidates being elected. So let's take, let's say, Republicans, and you look at the proportion of funding they received as it goes up were elected almost in a straight line. Uh, and the, the presidential election, you know, it was over two billion dollars this time. Now there's a lot of talk about how money didn't work because, you know, Sheldon Adelson spent a 
$100 million and didn't get what he want. But that's not true. Uh, everyone got, who funded got what they want. Mm -hmm. The candidates who are in office, thanks to the huge funding, are beholden to the funders. Uh, they, they're the ones who bought their positions effectively. And if they want to stay in office, they're going to have to go back to them. So that means they have to do what they want. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a big surprise that Obama, when he came in in 2008 with a huge support for the financial institutions, had turned to shining their shoes, doing what they wanted. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that's yeah. it's neither democratic nor just. Yeah, and the point you made about voter apathy, I think, uh, voter apathy, the point you made about that, I think, it resonates a lot, especially with students in universities such as NYU. There's not only voter apathy at NYU to vote in general elections, I think there's just apathy about what students can do within their schools to demand some kind of change. For example, NYU is considering its next huge, massive expansion plan. It's called 2031. And, and of course, tuition is going to keep on rising. But virtually, students are completely not involved in the decision-making process. Faculty as well are not, are not involved very much. So the administration is making moves and it is expanding. And uh, the students sort of feel, well, there's nothing I can do about it. I don't have a voice. Therefore, there's nothing I can do. Well, it's kind of <laughs> drilled into our heads from mm. childhood. So there's nothing we can do. But it's all too big. Mm. You know, I think that's one of the reasons for the crazy gun culture in the country. Mm -hmm. A lot of people feel, look, i got to defend myself somehow right. from the government, from power or something, right. so I'll get a gun. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not my government, like right. I can't organize with other people and vote. Right. Actually, an interesting reflection of this is the attitude towards taxes. Mm -hmm. I and mean, if you do a kind of a thought experiment and imagine a functioning democracy, mm -hmm. uh, what would people feel about taxes? Mm -hmm. Well, April 15th would be a day of celebration. Mm -hmm. We're getting together to fund the projects that we decided on. Mm -hmm. What's better than that? <laughs> uh, here it's a, day, it's a day of mourning mm -hmm. because some alien entity, a you know, big thing out there, is hovering over us and it's going to steal our money from us. Mm -hmm. That's a good indication of how low the conception of democracy is. Mm -hmm. And it's substantially because it doesn't bring about justice. Mm -hmm. If you want people to feel a function in a democracy, it's going to have to lead to a just outcome. All right. Very kind of good. Yes, and Professor Chomsky, thank you very much. Thank you. You have a very tight schedule. You have a cold. Thank you for making this exception. Okay.